Good day. I'm Hannah Behrens, Acting Director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is titled On the Wrong Path, Protecting the European Union's External Border in the Western Balkans. Joining us today are three distinguished experts working in this field. Ms. Karen Metz at Save the Children International, Mr. Ugo Poli at the Secretariat Secretariat of the Central European Initiative, and Mr. Peter van der Auerhaert at the International Organization for Migration, or otherwise known as IOM. First, a uh, housekeeping note. The audio from today's webinar will be available later on today at migrationpolicy.org slash events. Should you have a problem accessing the webinar, do contact us at events at migrationpolicy.org. There is no voice Q&A, um, but if you have a question that you would like to pose to the panelists, please use the Q&A chat function on the right of the screen throughout the webinar, or write us at events at migrationpolicy.org or tweet at MPI underscore Europe or hashtag MPI Discuss. This webinar, which zooms in on the external dimension of EU strategy to better manage migration, comes at an important juncture. With the newly elected European Parliament and the formation of a new European Commission, we are witnessing a change of power and leadership at the EU. Once appointed, these European leaders will have to quickly get out of the starting block to come to an agreement on the EU's next budget, but also to tackle the long-standing impasse on how to reform the EU's common European asylum system. With ongoing disagreement on how to organize the EU's internal dimension of migration management, the member states and EU actors have shifted their policy focus and investment outward. Reducing, if not preventing, new arrivals has become the primary target, and the tools to do so are cooperation with third countries and reinforcing the EU's external border. We see this at sea, with, for example, the support and training provided to the Libyan Coast Guard, but also on land, such as in the Western Balkans, which we will discuss today, where, for example, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, also known as Frontex, is exercising its new enhanced capacities alongside national border agents, but also in the Spanish enclaves of North Africa in Ceuta and Melilla. These factors make it a crucial moment to take stock of the effectiveness of the EU's increasingly hardened external border and its implications for those countries and local communities caught on the front line, as well as for those making the very journey. There are a number of challenges and considerations stemming from this approach, which we hope to unpack more over the next hour, such as what impact is growing into externalization having on the EU's relationship with its neighbors? Do Western Balkan countries have the resources in terms of reception as well as integration in order to manage heightened arrivals and a potentially growing and diverse settled population? And who are the actors in the region that already support efforts to build capacity and resilience, such as local civil society organizations, international organizations such as IOM, UNHCR, and Save the Children, and also regional peer support organizations? And what more can be done? Where are the financial governance and coordination gaps, particularly between the EU, national, and local governments? What are the implications for migrants and refugees themselves of externalization, such as access to protection and legal recourse against alleged abuse by border guards? What is the impact on the local communities that accommodate them? In sum, how can we move towards a more comprehensive, in-depth analysis of what are the implications for a cluster of regions to respond to migratory ambitions and movements towards Europe? 
how do we work with the fact that some of these transit or impromptu arrival countries may have few resources, potentially low protection safeguards, and may themselves operate in a very fragile geopolitical context? And how can the EU move to a more sustainable policy response as it continues to engage on the external front? We now turn to our first speaker, Mr. Ugo Pori. He's the manager at the Transnational Cooperation Project at the Secretariat of the Central European Initiative in Trieste. Mr. Poli, we would like to ask you, what are some of the risks and opportunities that increasing migratory arrivals pose to the Western Balkan region at the local level? Thank you. Thank you, Hani. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to join you and uh, would like uh, immediately to enter the subject that is uh, about uh, the understanding that uh, the focal point migration of the Central European Initiative Secretariat uh, recorded the long four years of activity after the CI was appointed by the Ministries of Foreign Affairs uh, of our 17, that time 18, member states uh, uh, to deal with the migration uh, crisis from the point of view of the governance of uh, migration flows. Actually, this remains uh, a goal of uh, our uh, activity, and uh, uh, currently we refer mostly to the achievements of uh, a large uh, uh, project uh, we implemented between end of 2017, beginning 2018, together with uh, MARI and uh, uh, NALAS. Being uh, the subject of this uh, uh, initiative, uh, focused on uh, the uh, added values achievable by the cooperation of uh, state administrations uh, and uh, local authorities in dealing uh, with the uh, incoming uh, uh, migrant uh, uh, people. Uh, this project uh, uh, was based uh, on uh, uh, country-based workshops that we held in all the uh, Western Balkan region and uh, a final uh, conference when we uh, developed uh, uh, useful recommendations uh, for, for, the, for the institutions of, uh, of the region. Actually, uh, there, were, there are a number of uh, common features uh, uh, in the uh, Balkan uh, area. The first one is uh, that uh, uh, after the agreement in uh, 2016, uh, considered as a closing of uh, the Balkan route, uh, there was uh, a, a waste of time without uh, adequate uh, uh, regulatory uh, upgrading and also the technical assistance in capacity building both at central and at the decentralized level remain very, very slow. The consequences uh, are visible in uh, what is happening since uh, the re re return uh, of uh, uh, people along uh, the Balkan route uh, uh, started uh, beginning last year. There is a, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, gaps between uh, the state administration role and uh, the local uh, action. Since uh, uh, local authorities, the municipalities, this is a fundamental point, are anyway those that uh, in the territory are dealing with the impact of newcomers must uh, arrange uh, services also on emergency conditions, must uh, uh, educate uh, and uh, uh, smooth uh, the impact of newcomers into the local communities and, uh, and the population. There are a lot uh, of uh, success stories where majors and their communities were able to perform both uh, at the highest level of humanitarian values 
and according with uh, law uh, obtained uh, uh, to have uh, ad quite ad additional support by a state authority. But what is lacking is uh, still a general framework uh, to establish the institutional reciprocal responsibility between uh, uh, governments uh, at central level and uh, uh, local authorities. This is a subject that remain uh, very uh, up to date and uh, uh, deserve further consideration for uh, funding also uh, through the uh, next uh, uh, programming period, period of the uh, European Union in order to deliver also in the uh, area beneficiary of the IPA program the kind of uh, endeavor that is going on for the new programming of structural funds within the EU member states. There is actually a, a strong commitment to uh, better finalize uh, available resources in order to uh, make the most of uh, the uh, migration flows uh, in parallel with uh, the uh, commitment to uh, establish reg regular legal channels for incoming people and go beyond the current uh, problem represented by the wandering of people arrived irregularly. This is particularly sensitive in uh, uh, the Western Balkans, since uh, there are big differences between uh, state and state, and uh, uh, to uh, go beyond the emergency needs also an harmonization of uh, uh, the regulatory of the regulatory framework. These are the main uh, uh, the main uh, uh, issues. Uh, that are more uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, along the available uh, uh, presentation that you have uh, that you have uh, on your screen now, and uh, that is uh, uh, feeding also the endeavor of all the partners and also others to uh, uh, to set up a program for initiatives feeding. Uh, the uh, local uh, dimension uh, capacity to uh, deal with uh, the migration uh, flows and uh, to uh, prevent uh, further deterioration of the uh, relationship between uh, newcomers uh, and uh, settlers uh, of the uh, current uh, uh, of the current uh, regions this is uh, everything by me for now. Uh, I can give you back. Uh... Thank you, Ugo. Thank you. Uh, thank you also um, for showing how uh, uh, the local level is actually really at the forefront of receiving and dealing with, with newcomers and how at the one hand that poses large challenges, but also with the right input from mayors can, can result in, in success stories. And, and also for pointing out, of course, the political context in which these different countries uh, are operating in terms of your reference to the instrument for pre-accession assistance, IPA, which of course uh, relates to the fact that a number of these uh, Western Balkan countries are candidates to, to join the EU and that of course influence the kind of relationship and negotiation that are going on between the EU and the Western Balkan countries. Uh, but we now turn to uh, Karen Metz. Karen Metz works at Save the Children International, where she's a senior advoc advocacy advisor in relation to asylum and migration and children on the move. Uh, Karen, we would like to ask you, in terms of um, the impact of the externalization of the EU border, on the protection of, of vulnerable populations in, in that region. Can you tell us a bit more on how that impacts on, for example, the situation for unaccompanied minors um, and accompanied refugee children there as well? Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you for uh, including me in this webinar. Uh, I will first zoom in a little bit to the situation on the ground, and then I will look at the bigger picture because Save the Children has done some analysis 
on the impact of the EU's external migration policies on children in the Western Balkans, but also in other regions. So Save the Children uh, currently runs programs in Bosnia, Serbia, and we're soon starting up a new program in Albania. What we do concretely is we work in the Unasana canton in Bosnia, uh, where we work in the four refugee camps focusing on child protection and education. This means that we assist families and unaccompanied children um, with case management, and refer, that, that means that we refer them to the appropriate services, ensure that they have access to psychosocial care, to a doctor, that they know where the schools are, that they find the right services, that they have access to food, etc. We also have a mobile unit running over the whole Unasana Canton, and it's important to note that Unasana Canton in Bosnia is hosting most of the refugees that arrive to Bosnia. Uh, I think currently there are about 7,000 migrants and refugees, of which uh, half are uh, hosted in uh, refugee camps in the Unasana Canton. Um, we also assist uh, children that are going to school, so we uh, escort them on their way to school, we provide them with materials, and we uh, help them with their homework, and we support the schools to also accommodate these children. Um, we run a Balkan Migration Displacement Hub, which looks at the trends and does research and analysis on migrant flows in the Western Balkans and uh, focusing specifically on children and vulnerable populations. Now, what do we observe? Uh, and I'm going to focus also specifically on uh, Bosnia and the border between Bosnia and Croatia. Uh, we observe that there is a huge lack of accommodation uh, for refugees and migrants arriving. About half of them, as I said, are currently accommodated in temporary reception centers. And these are generally quite big centers accommodating 1,000, 2,000 people. Um, another thing that we observe is violence. And we've a lot of people have already heard about the pushbacks at the borders. They've been widely documented, um, especially in the border, on the border between Croatia and Bosnia. What we also have seen uh, increasing reports of is violence uh, or inappropriate behavior by uh, police officers inside Bosnia, meaning that people, for instance, going out of the camps to do some grocery shopping or sometimes singled out and violently transported back to the camp, sometimes even to camps where they aren't residing, or that people sitting on trains are singled out and, and, and violently requested to leave those trains, et cetera. So we see an increase of kind of, I think, what we can call hostility also maybe between the local population and um, the refugees and migrants arriving because um, they used to transit through Bosnia, and right now some of them cannot transit because the border is closed, so there's an increasing population staying there. Um, what we see and what we think needs to change. So in the short run, a lot of the problems that we face from a humanitarian perspective have also to do with the way Bosnia operates as a country. There are a lot of, which, which uh, our colleague also mentioned before, there are a lot of different layers of government governance. You have the local level, you have the entity, you have the canton, you have the federation, you have a lot of different actors that are responsible for different things, and it's not always clear to identify, it's not always possible to identify who is responsible for what. So in the short run, and this is really like before the winter arrives, what we want is that there's a clear coordination mechanism set up to address this emergency of which the Bosnian government also kind of takes responsibility, takes charge, takes ownership. What we also want to see is, of course, better investment in appropriate accommodation, also looking at the long-term system strengthening and looking at durable solutions. And from Save the Children's perspective, we try to focus on strengthening child protection education mechanisms, also looking towards the future to maybe establish guardianship mechanisms and better functioning asylum systems as well. Um, what we see, and then I'm speaking about the impact of externalization, what we see is uh, we see this in the Western Balkans, but we've also seen this in Morocco and Tunisia and other countries, is that we have a large population uh, residing in a country that they're not welcome in and, they, and that they do not want to stay in. These people generally have um, limited access to rights and procedures, which is a huge issue, which we also observe in Bosnia. 
and they um, they are often confronted with police violence and violence of border guards. Um, so I think what needs to happen is a number of things. Firstly, there needs, to, there needs to be a focus, and if we're looking at the role of the EU, there needs to be a focus on system strengthening. This has, we've seen some progress in Serbia on this, where the reception capacity has improved and they're trying to put in place a, fun, a properly functioning asylum system. In Bosnia, this is a bit more complicated, but in the long run, this is something we need to work towards. And it's, it's also a mentality change. It's not only providing access to housing and education, but also looking at systems and ensuring people that apply for asylum can do so, but also people that have no right to, 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 to asylum, that eventually uh, it turns out that they don't have a right to asylum, can be returned in a dignified manner. The systems are currently not functioning. Then we also need to look at borders. Good border management does not mean preventing by all means that people access their ter territory. It does not have to be violent. Frontex could play a role here. Uh, Frontex is currently present in Croatia, so they could focus on strengthening the capacity, ensuring that border guards are aware of kind of, of, of the rules, that they can know which kind of systems irregular migrants arriving have access to, that they know that if someone applies to asylum, they should have access to that system inside Croatia as well, that they can identify uh, children that are victims of trafficking and refer them to the right child protection system. But I mean, we also see Frontex is currently present in Croatia. And at first, we as Save the Children, we assumed that that would kind of mitigate the violence that we observe at borders, but it hasn't been mitigated. So. Uh, either they're deployed to Frontex officials at places where the violence do not occur, or they're unaware of it, or they close an eye to it. Of course, Frontex is operating under the mandate of the hosting country, so they have a limited political space. This is why uh, we also need to invest in independent monitoring at borders. And this is something the EU can also support. The EU can support a civil society that has the space to do this kind of monitoring, but also support other organizations such as maybe the Council of Europe or the OSCE or the Committee on the Rights of the Child to really frequently monitor the situation at borders and connect accountability mechanisms to it. That means that people that commit uh, acts of, uh, that, that, that violate human rights are held accountable. And then, of course, EU member states should also play their role. They should provide access to asylum, and they shouldn't raise obstacles if people try to access certain procedures. For instance, if someone is trying to apply for family unification from, from Bosnia or from Serbia, they need to be able to do so. There need to be proper uh, mechanisms for resettlement and also readmission agreements, which exist. So these readmission agreements need to be properly implemented. This is more or less, in a nutshell, what we feel, where we feel the European Union uh, can play a role. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for uh, outlining the different kind of challenges that uh, you and, and your broader organization have observed in relation to, as you were saying, hostility at the borders or, or hostility that maybe uh, occurs with, with the local population who um, has to deal with um, increasing arrivals or sustained arrivals over time and for the, the range of, of potential ways forward that you have sketched in terms of, on the one hand, maybe within uh, these countries, a better coordination between the different kinds of, of levels of governments and um, how also maybe through um, support from the EU and international organizations, systems that they have already in place in terms of asylum and services available for asylum seekers can actually be further, further strengthened. And then by pointing out also the kind of role that EU and EU agencies can play, such as Frontex, in terms of better manage, border management and investment and cooperation with uh, local border guards. And last but not least also, of course, the, the role that EU member states themselves um, play in terms of making sure that people do uh, have the right to access um, asylum uh, within uh, Europe. Uh, we now turn to uh, Peter van der Auerhaert, um, who works at the IOM. He's the Western Balkans coordinator and the global lead for transitional justice and crisis-related land issues um, for Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Um, and with Peter, we would like to discuss some of the key lessons 
for Western Balkan countries and the EU from the crisis this winter, the, the, the last winter? And, and what should some of the incoming EU policymakers consider if they continue uh, with this policy going forward? Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. I'll maybe start uh, very briefly with highlighting the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then move on to, to the topics that, that you have assigned to me. Um, the Western Balkans route was sort of closed, but then I think January of last year it sort of reopened in the sense that um, we saw late 2017 smugglers uh, testing out the route to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, to Unasana Canton, which is attractive in the sense that it's bordering with uh, Croatia, but most importantly, it's about 60 kilometers away from Slovenia, the first uh, Schengen country. We started to see movements from people traveling uh, to Bosnia, to Croatia, Slovenia, then Austria, and then eventually, because the border controls in Austria were increased towards Italy, Trieste, which is now the main route. I, I think it's important to emphasize that that route was uh, from a migrant perspective, open in the sense that Bosnia received last year about 25,000 registered arrivals. Um, and uh, at no given day, we had more than 4,500, 5,000 uh, inside the country. So that suggests that 20,000 people or more actually managed to get through Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, <clears throat> this year, we have about 12,000 people, and as the, the previous speaker pointed out, the number of people in the country is probably around 8,000 or so is increasing because of the fact that it has become more complicated for people to get through, but still people are getting through uh, Croatia and then onwards Slovenia and uh, Italy. <clears throat> I think it's important to first start with a, an, an accurate categorization of the migration that we're facing here, which is, I would say, pure transit migration. I would uh, guess that about 99% of the people that at least upon arriving in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I have only one intention, which is to get out of Bosnia and Herzegovina as quickly as possible and move onwards uh, towards uh, the, the European Union. I think it's also important to emphasize that most of the movements are from uh, inside the EU, meaning uh, mostly Greece and, and to a lesser extent Bulgaria, towards other parts of the EU, or by the Western Balkans and Bosnia in particular, uh, is being used simply as a transit route from one part of the EU uh, towards the other part of the EU, which I think also is important to understand uh, when we start discussing what are sort of longer term uh, solutions uh, to this issue from a Western Balkans perspective. Um, the challenges are clear, and I think a couple of the, the previous speakers already highlighted them. There's a humanitarian uh, challenge, which obviously focuses very much around the need for official reception capacity, which we don't really have at sufficient levels here in Bosnia and Herzegovina for the reasons that were um, explained uh, earlier. I think I want to just maybe add to what the previous speaker said. I think the population in the Western Balkans has reacted generally, especially in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, quite positively, and I think with a lot of understanding and humanity towards the arriving migrants. The patients in Bosnia and Herzegovina is running thin, not so much with the migrants, but with the inability of the authorities to uh, manage this, and especially the reception part of it, manages in a proper uh, in a proper way. We know the situation that more than half of the migrants in Unasana Canton are living in, in either private accommodation, which is often inadequate, and in some a totally inadequate location that the city of Biatch has identified uh, in the field, and Bushiak, which are the, the, the videos have been doing the rounds, I think, uh, in, in the international media. Um, obviously, it poses security challenges as well. I mean, they're sometimes um, over uh, emphasized, but there are real security uh, challenges in the terms of the local uh, law and order. Um, the systems here, police, law enforcement agencies are not used to dealing with a population uh, that is comes from different culture, often doesn't have identity documents. Uh, it's only a small minority, of course, that is causing uh, problems for the local population, but the authorities have struggled uh, in how to deal with that. And of course, it also poses the challenge of uh, how the asylum services cope with people that do apply for asylum. Now, I have to emphasize that I think in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that 90% of the people that are actually here um, are economic migrants in the sense that uh, they will not, uh, they're very unlikely unless they have specific uh, individual circumstances to qualify for international protection uh, anywhere inside uh, the European Union. Um, and of course, as is happening also in, in EU member states, a lot of people are using the asylum process to try to legalize their stay uh, for a longer period of time while they try to move onwards uh, to the EU. And one of the challenges of the asylum services here in Bosnia is, for example, 
uh, is that um, many of the people that they have registered as asylum seekers are, are no longer uh, in the country. Now, when we look at uh, longer term solutions, uh, of course, the humanitarian uh, solutions are, are uh, what is required in the, in the short term. We need, as, as, the form, as the earlier speaker said, we need urgently more reception capacity, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is not the case in Serbia, but uh, this is not a longer term solution. This is just a matter of um, making sure that people have access to, to base or that their basic needs are fulfilled uh, during the period that they are in the country. Uh, but I think overall, uh, the longer term solution is a full integration of the Western Balkans within uh, asylum and migration policies uh, within the EU. I mean, they're all candidate member countries, but I think it's one area where that integration probably needs to be uh, accelerated. Uh, one uh, thing I think that is urgently, or that one part of the solution, uh, is to move towards a situation where the Western Balkans countries could be sa safe third countries, where uh, the asylum processes are strengthened, uh, which need to happen uh, in terms of the EU at key in any case, strengthened to such a degree that people that are in need of international protection can actually obtain international protection in those countries, because I believe that the number of people traveling through the Western Balkans, for example, from Greece to, let's say, France or Belgium or Sweden or Germany, would reduce um, if it would be clear that, uh, well, once you have been in Bosnia and Herzegovina, once you've been in Serbia, once you've been in Macedonia, well, you'll have to go back there because your uh, asylum uh, process uh, will be dealt with there. And I think that uh, this is an opportunity also for those countries to strengthen those um, protection mechanisms, which they need to do in any case, but I think it is part of the of the solution. Once these protection mechanisms are in place, once these asylum processes are acceptable, then they can get the, the certainly become uh, safe third countries where, where people can be uh, returned uh, to. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on combating migrant smuggling, which of course, uh, from a rule of law uh, perspective, uh, needs to be done. But I think we need to be cautious with a short-term uh, impact uh, on that. Uh, smuggling of migrants is, is a huge business here in the Western Balkans. Uh, there are smuggling networks in place that have been smuggling drugs, weapons, cigarettes, other things for many years uh, since the break of, of the former Yugoslavia, of, the, of Yugoslavia. What you see now is these groups diversifying, if you want, uh, into uh, smuggling uh, of human beings. And it's, uh, while I think, of course, it is important to combat smuggling because this is business uh, happening outside the law, I think we also don't need to expect or cannot expect miracles from the short term. If we look at uh, the, the efforts that were made to combat, for example, drug smuggling and cigarette sm smuggling or even weapon smuggling, which, which have been relatively modest. So that is part of the solution. Um, I think there is a need for uh, the border controls, yes, uh, and I agree with the preceding uh, speaker that uh, improved border controls does not mean uh, that one has to use violence. I mean, this can be done uh, in respect and should be done in respect with uh, human, uh, human rights provisions. However, I also do believe that once people are in the Western Balkans and they are um, really set on moving onwards uh, towards the European Union, uh, I'm not entirely convinced that um, readmission from, let's say, Bosnia to Serbia or from Bosnia to Montenegro and then from Montenegro back to Albania uh, leads to a lot of results because these people reappear in any case uh, elsewhere uh, in the route. Um, so while border controls are important to control the entry and the exit of people in the country, of course, uh, again, I think it is very difficult given the, also the geography, for example, of Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, in terms of borders, um, to expect that border controls even by themselves will um, prevent people from coming here. And in any case, you just displace the challenge from, let's say, Bosnia to Serbia or from Bosnia to uh, Montenegro, which is debatable in, in terms of uh, its effectiveness. Um, I think we need to have um, return frameworks in place. Certainly, uh, if we would have st uh, stronger uh, asylum processes that would be acceptable in terms of uh, international standards, um, there needs to be mechanisms for people to be returned, either voluntary return, which IOM already offers to migrants, and we've seen an uptick in the number of migrants uh, that are uh, opting to go home voluntarily. Last year we had about seven, 800 people, which is not a large amount, but still it is an important measure. But uh, the Western Balkans countries currently are not uh, in any position to do forced returns. And, and of course, uh, forced returns are not necessarily the preferred option, but I think we need to be realistic also that no matter how liberal uh, your migration policies are, there will always be people that fall outside the people that can enter legally and they need to be returned home if they do not opt to return voluntarily. But it is uh, politically impossible for, let's say, Bosnia-Herzegovina 
to returning people to Algeria, to Pakistan, unless that is done uh, together with the European Union. So I think uh, a solid return framework that focuses both on voluntary return and if that doesn't work or, or is not chosen by the migrants, uh, forcible return uh, is important as well. Um, when it comes to um, the integ local integration, I think that while uh, obviously the Western Balkans uh, face a huge democratic, uh, demographic uh, rather, challenge uh, in terms of a large number of people leaving all the countries of the Western Balkans almost on a daily basis, uh, which creates, of course, uh, gaps uh, in the labor market, uh, certainly. Um, there are two elements. First, I think politically and at the level of both at the politics, uh, I would say elite politics and, and at the level of the, uh, of the population, the discussion of uh, having migrants actually coming to the Western Balkans is something that is at its very infancy. And I think that we're still very far away from an acceptance that that is something that the Western Balkans uh, should be looking at. Uh, given the fact that there are still relatively high levels of unemployment inside the countries, given the prevalence of uh, poverty and so on, there is not much appetite, I think, uh, amongst the population uh, and politically uh, to, to have that as a discussion. But maybe the most fundamental part is that uh, when we speak to irregular migrants, uh, IOM runs uh, five centers here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and we ask them, why do, you, why do you not want to try and stay here and work? It is also very clear that um, for example, Pakistani nationals will say this quite open. We have spent seven, eight, nine thousand euros to get to Europe. Uh, the salaries and the conditions here in Bosnia and Herzegovina are such that there is no interest for us, no incentive for us to stay here. The same reasons that makes Bosnians go, because they can, as a cleaning lady, even uh, make a lot more money in Germany than they can in Bosnia. That is also why migrants are not interested uh, in staying here. So I think even if the conditions uh, would be uh, created uh, and there would be a political willingness to discuss. Um, having labor migration towards the Western Balkans, I think it will not be so easy to actually attract uh, labor migrants or to convince people to stay here, even if jobs would be available because the working conditions are, are not great. Um, finally, and that is certainly a, a pipe dream, uh, I think politically it is impossible, but if you look at, for example, what is happening with migration, that irregular migrants and refugees are traveling around the Western Balkans, certainly they make the case for some sort of Schengen-like arrangement within the Western Balkans uh, whereby the Western Balkans will be one zone when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, dealing with migrants and refugees uh, in the Western Balkans. There were countries would actually uh, divide, uh, to a certain degree, um, the, um, providing assistance uh, to migrants and uh, providing migrants with access to asylum. I think that is a pipe dream, but I do think it's at the same time uh, maybe one of the longer term goals that could be discussed here, because the reality is that people move inside the Western Balkans uh, as if it is a Schengen, uh, uh, as if it is a Schengen uh, area in any case. So that is something that I think in the longer term is something that could be part um, of the discussion. But so as a final point, I think uh, these past couple of years have shown that uh, whether um, membership uh, will happen or not, a full integration of the Western Balkans within the asylum and migration policies uh, of the EU is the only way forward because de facto, uh, whatever happens in the EU on migration and asylum is uh, affecting uh, the Western Balkan countries, uh, all of them, because they are all countries that are used as transit routes from one part of the EU uh, to other parts of the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and thank you also for, in the beginning, uh, outlining some of the figures and, and also not only the numbers of, of people arriving now, but also in terms of the potential composition in terms of asylum seekers versus migrants, which then really underscore your impo uh, the importance that you, you point out in terms of the fact that a response not only needs to look at the issue of asylum and how that element can be strengthened, but also thinking through some of the challenges that also a lot of EU member states currently face about how do we deal with people who come with a different kind of profile, with different types of interests and motivations, and how do we make sure that if there is a need uh, or a focus on return to do this more effectively rather than bouncing back persons um, from one country to the next and, and that element. So a strong um, um, argument from your side in terms of, of that full integration of, of Western Balkan countries in terms of EU's migration policy uh, um, framework. Um, we've now come to the, the Q&A part of this webinar, and so I would like to invite uh, listeners to to use the Q&A function on their screen or email ev um, events at migrationpolicy.org if you do have questions that you would like to pose um, to our speakers. 
Um, maybe if I can at this point return to uh, Ugo Pori to, to ask um, through the, the project that you were involved in and that you've um, followed over the last uh, months and, and period, um, can you give us a couple of Sorry, hi. Could you give us a few um, examples of how, um, what kind of steps that local authorities yes, have taken? The comment, the, the, the statements I heard, uh, in particular, uh, Peter, that uh, I, I largely agree, but uh, with uh, some uh, consideration. Uh, first of all, I think there is uh, the need of uh, a pressure by European Union to the Balkan governments to harmonize quicker and broader to the European acquis. It's not perfect, we know, there are big holes, we know, but anyway it is a framework that uh, most of Balkan countries are not attaining and they should be uh, uh, supported and uh, uh, in incentivated uh, to uh, upgrade uh, the general framework. I mean, for instance, uh, Serbia approved uh, at the end of uh, 2018 a very good uh, large uh, legal framework that is substantially in line with uh, uh, EU general uh, uh, legislation. In Macedonia, there was a totally different situation, and also with the new approach of the current government, there are uh, dramatic gaps in terms of uh, uh, regulation and, uh, and uh, uh, methodologies of dealing with the migrants. And uh, there is a contradiction also to be uh, uh, faced. On one hand, uh, uh, for many time and currently too, uh, there is something as a delegation to Western Balkans to be the, the advanced uh, uh, watchdog uh, of external borders of the European Union. On the other hand, when they uh, uh, let uh, enter people, they are also contemporarily hoping uh, or it, uh, it, encouraging their transit as uh, quicker as, uh, uh, as possible. This is uh, absurd because, uh, in fact, the result is that everything happens in a disordered way, like is possible to see currently in the Bosnian situation. I don't think that Bosnia uh, is uh, such a poor uh, country that uh, they cannot uh, they could have not dealt in different way 10,000 people as uh, it is the current estimation of uh, presence uh, of uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, in the country and let alone the municipality of Bihać and the other border municipalities by the central government uh, uh, with, without uh, both uh, uh, money and uh, skills and uh, uh, formal institutional support. Uh, in my opinion, the Bosnian uh, more critical conditions uh, on the uh, western uh, border with uh, Croatia in, uh, in particular uh, have uh, uh, strong uh, political responsibilities in the way the uh, central government uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, absent uh, in uh, supporting concretely the uh, emergency one year ago and over, uh, and currently uh, an adequate uh, uh, answer to the uh, demand for uh, assistance uh, and uh, reception, uh, whatever uh, duration this reception could uh, have. Stop here, but clearly I have also a number of other comments to share with you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ugo. Um, yeah, and I think it's an, indeed an important element. It's something that's often stressed, the idea that 
these countries should also move towards a greater adoption of, of the EU asylum um, acquis. That's, of course, one thing. But as you say, um, the other element is then, of course, implementation. We know these countries also already struggle. They may have it even in their constitution, some of these elements. But then when it comes to the application of that, uh, of those laws, it, it can become quite uh, problematic. Um, and maybe then on that vein, if I can turn to, to Karen, um, because, Yes, you were already Sorry, pointing uh, out. I mean, yes, if I can just uh, to just to add uh, one uh, consideration. Uh, it, it, my opinion about the Bosnian situation is also based uh, on the comparison of the purely security approach by the Ministry of Interiors compared with the willingness of both municipalities, I knew and know, and uh, of the Ministry of Labor, for instance for a substantial assistance to integration of those willing to find peace beyond of continuing their transit to Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Karen, uh, I'm just turning to you now. Um, I don't know if you have any co um, comments in relation to what Ugo said based on, on the experience of, of Save the Children in implementing some of those kind of uh, or legal frameworks in relation to asylum in the in the country that Save the Children operates. But next to that, we know how important capacity building is, and uh, you're also involved, and if my understanding is correct, in relation to Frontex, uh, speaking to border guards involved, and also helping to build their knowledge on, on how to deal with those who come to their borders. Could you expand a bit on, on both of those elements? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the point that we definitely need to need to make sure that there's system strengthening, that the policy frameworks are in place, and that the asylum key is being kind of implemented in the Western Balkan countries, and this is a work in progress. But it is true, as you also say, that there are still some gaps in implementation, and that very few asylum uh, claims are effectively being processed up until the end. And this has as, as many causes, as, as, as Peter was also saying, people choose to move on. But one thing that we also find crucial is that people sometimes aren't properly informed about their rights and which procedures they have access to. We found this not only in the Balkan countries, but also in other countries such as Italy and Spain. Sometimes people don't know that they can access asylum, that they have opportunities in these transit countries, that they can apply for family reunification, etc., uh, what the consequences are if they cross the border. So we do believe that um, better information sharing can also play a big part um, in, in, in making sure that people do stay um, and a better implementation. This, this is a mentality change, right? I mean, I think it's difficult for many countries to transit, for, to, to move from being a transit country to, to a country where people remain. Uh, and this is a slow process. And um, in Serbia, yes, progress has been made. I think in Bosnia, a lot of steps still need to be taken. Uh, we need to be realistic. This will not be uh, for the immediate term. And in the meantime, we do have uh, a population of seven, 8,000 people there, and we do need to find solutions for them. Um, so I think we need to focus on several areas, not just one. When it comes to Frontex, um, we, we advise them uh, on some of the child protection issues. They have some handbooks on how to work with children at borders, which are good. But again, we need a bit of a mentality change because it, for, for me, when I speak about vulnerability, it's about vulnerability of children or people that I see. For Frontex, when they speak about vulnerability, that means that a border uh, lets people pass through, right? That's a, a, a vulnerable border. So it's a very different approach that border guards have to these kind of situations. So yes, I think also, again, we need to focus on capacity building, but with the capacity, you, you can give people a training, but you really need to be also there when when they are operational in the field to see how they are implementing that training, uh, because I, I think only with capacity building we won't get there. Thank you, Karen, and thank you also for that uh, um, interesting remark about the definition and the concept of vulnerability and how it's uh, understood in different kind of contexts. Um, if I can turn to, to Peter now. Um, Peter, we've, we've heard from, from the different speakers uh, today that there's this kind of tension, right, between 
what local authorities can or wish to do, the capacity that they have, the financial means that they have, and some of the interests that actually then live at a national level and may um, yeah, be contradictory uh, as they engage, for example, with, with the EU and, and are on that uh, journey towards um, being a candidate for uh, joining the EU. Could you share a bit more about that, that kind of tension and how it's actually affecting the kinds of responses that we see at the local authority level when it comes to dealing with these populations? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think, first of all, I think one, one thing that is important to emphasize, uh, and it's something that uh, Ugo referred to, of course, Bosnia-Herzegovina could have done more. Uh, the migration crisis came about. It's too long a discussion for this, but it came about at a very difficult political moment with the elections being prepared, uh, the unity within the state government that was always quite tenuous at best, uh, being even more under stress because of the elections, and now we don't actually have uh, the new government as yet. So all these factors together made that uh, within the, the challenges that Bosnia and Herzegovina always faced, the extreme decentralized nature and multiple political centers of power, uh, that was compounded by this, this uh, the period in which this migration crisis started. I think the second point that is sometimes I think uh, under uh, appreciated within the EU is that. There is a very strong sense, I think, here amongst uh, politicians that uh, they are dealing uh, with this problem, and I'm not saying that they're right, but they're dealing with this problem because the EU has been uh, incapable of properly dealing with um, irregular migration and uh, asylum as well uh, itself. So there is um, somewhat of a, when when the EU comes and, and tries to um, suggest that, that countries here should go more, there, there is a lot of pushback on that because of the perception that, well, you know, the fact that people are in Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's, it's a function of the fact that Greece and Bulgaria in this particular case were, on the one hand, unable to um, stop those people from leaving their countries, because that is a discourse that you hear here when people say, okay, Bosnia-Herzegovina should do more about these border controls. It's like, well, but maybe the border controls should, should have been tighter in Greece and Bulgaria. Plus, conditions in Bulgaria and Greece should be better or should be more promising for the future. Then we wouldn't have to deal with those people. Again, I think the, the, the reality is a little bit more complex. Uh, but that is something that I think, to a certain degree, limits uh, the, the leverage of the, of the EU. Thirdly, I think the sense that um, when you say, you know, when you talk about EU membership, um, I, I think there are two elements. Is that something that drives or not? I think on the one hand, it does drive in the sense that, uh, and especially in Bosnia-Herzegovina, I, I don't believe that there is unanimity amongst the political elite that, that Bosnia-Herzegovina should really join the EU. Uh, but on the other hand, also EU membership has, is something that is so far away. Uh, and to remember, um, the EU key is, is very large. It's not just about uh, migration. I mean, countries are on the one hand, I think, feeling that maybe is this membership ever going to happen? You saw the discussion around, around North Macedonia and Albania, where there was this sense that, especially North Macedonia, maybe had done enough uh, to, to at least move on to the next phase. It didn't really happen. It's been postponed. Um, so the longer this EU membership stays away, also, I think the less that, um, you know, the, the enticing nature of that membership uh, drives people uh, to move forward uh, when it comes to, to this issue of migration and asylum. I, I don't know whether that sort of answers your question, but these are the, the, the three, uh, the three uh, elements. I mean, the final element, and that's sometimes, I think, uh, under-reported, uh, and I think there we have collectively a responsibility, and, and we have to be very careful with this, but uh, managing migration in this way has brought a lot of benefits also to the communities uh, where, for example, those centers are located in Serbia and to be also in Bosnia-Herzegovina. That means that there's a lot of money being invested in the local economy. Migrants spend a lot of money. Um, the international community spends a lot of money, and that has given us sort of a, a mini boost in some of those uninvested areas, for example, in Serbia and in, um, uh, and in Bosnia-Herzegovina as well. And that is something that, that should not be underestimated. There is a tendency uh, from politicians to always present this as a problem and a challenge, but well, actually, it's a little bit more uh, mitigated and, and, and mixed than that. So I just wanted to add that as an element. It also does have economic benefits. Uh, and, and frankly, migrants are spending quite a lot of money, I mean, in local terms, on, on, uh, while they're staying in this country. I think that is something that we should leverage better uh, in our communication also. Thank you, Peter. I mean, and also your comment being um, uh, that you made uh, resonates with one of the, the questions that is made uh, by the, the listeners. Uh, one of the questions they were asking or the, the comments they were making is that 
uh, if indeed EU protection acquis was implemented, then we would also have to see the implementation of the Dublin III regulation, and that would then also mean, for example, referral back to, to, to Bulgaria and Greece. And you were rightly referring to the fact that also those uh, asylum systems and the reception capacity there uh, are, are in need of, of further development and, and strengthening in that respect. Um, can, can, I I just say can, I, can I just say one very briefly on this? I mean, I think and you said something very important also. I think we need to, um, we need to look at this uh, closer because there is no point, if you have people that are coming from countries where it's very unlikely that they will receive international protection, moving these country people from country A to country B to country C uh, really doesn't make uh, very much sense. And we've been having discussions with colleagues from UNHCR also on that. If you have people from Pakistan where it's really exceptional that people obtain asylum, I mean, moving them from here back to Bulgaria, to Greece, or from Bosnia to Serbia, is really not a solution. It's not humane for the migrants. It's not a solution uh, from a migration policy perspective. So I think that's something that we need to think about as well in the context of how we move forward uh, inside the EU, together with the Western Balkans, hopefully, over from my side. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that resonates well with what you were saying in, in, in the beginning as well, um, given the, the the makeup of the of the people that are currently arriving, and if indeed a large proportion would not qualify for international protection, then how do we move for, forward on that? Um, uh, if I can um, turn to Ugo uh, in, in that sense, um, Ugo, have you seen in the work that you've had have done with uh, local authorities? Any initiatives also to deal with the fact, like on the one hand, yes, that people um, wish to move on and, and move towards Europe, but on the other hand, thinking through how they may, on the one hand, deal with the fact that there is uh, opportunities, maybe economic opportunities within the country, or whether that local authorities are actually stepping up initiatives to properly inform migrants about their, their chances to either move on or to actually um, get international protection within uh, the country or to uh, then move back to, to their third country where they, where they originate from. But I, I think we have to recover uh, the quotation of the role of civil society organizations that actually, since uh, 2015, were a faithful and skilled partner for both state and local administrations in dealing in practice uh, and also in bringing knowledge on how to do this uh, for the assistance uh, and uh, uh, reception and in cases integration of. Uh, uh, of migrants. This is another important point that should, could be better regulated even if uh, in most countries it works and is uh, 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 supplementing uh, the, uh, uh, the gaps and, uh, and uh, lack of uh, specific uh, uh, professionalism in the public uh, uh, administrations. Uh, I think uh, we have to consider how uh, there are two categories of uh, municipality particularly exposed to the impact that are those uh, for uh, near to the border of income and those near to the bo border of exit. Those uh, in the border of exit have uh, long staying and always longer uh, staying people there looking for the possibility or the impossibility to access uh, European, uh, European Union. But uh, uh, there are uh, very uh, meaningful stories uh, of civic commitment by public administrators and uh, the people that need to be uh, supported because uh, small municipalities cannot anticipate for years the costs of surviving of uh, the uh, of the assisted uh, migrants nor can uh, uh, supple supplement uh, the services for uh, a doubling of uh, their population this is, becomes the roots uh, of conflict whereas uh, frequently there are uh, nice stories i'm thinking uh, for instance, to the municipalities of Sid and of Schombor on the, uh, in Vojvodina uh, on the path to uh, Croatia, 
but uh, as incoming area also the municipality of Preshevo, for instance, where there are uh, nice stories how the majors were able to get by the central authorities uh, uh, substantial support to their role, increasing uh, the uh, quality of life, uh, not just for uh, uh, migrants, but uh, uh, first of all, for their own citizens uh, and uh, uh, leveraging on the responsibility of reception for a, a, a jump in the development of their uh, communities, as could have been done uh, more largely with a, a more structured and well-planned uh, uh, approach to the challenge. Uh, thank you, Hugo. I mean, I think it's really an interesting uh, also distinction that you're making about the very different kind of needs and challenges that, that local authorities face depending on, on where they're located and, and the kinds of uh, interest uh, that, that people have when they do arrive uh, in those communities. Um, before we close, we, we have a question from um, some of the listeners asking for um, recommendations as to what to, to access in terms of um, uh, reports or interesting uh, books or, or those kind of elements. I don't know uh, whether you would like to um, uh, suggest something. Karen, do you have uh, any suggestions as to uh, background reading material uh, that you would point out as maybe allowing somebody to jump into this uh, particular theme? On, on, what was the question? Ah, it was from Doris. Or no? What was the question no, exactly? No, it's, uh, it's a, a broader question um, about, um, well, if, if people are, are less uh, familiar uh, and not working in this field, whether you would be able to recommend any academic journals or news websites or blogs that, um, that are particularly interesting and allow people to stay abreast on, on this issue. Uh, from our end, I think there's some materials from Frontex that could give you some insight. Uh, the annual report of the Frontex Consultative Forum is also probably an interesting read. Uh, and, and they have an, also an annual report where they predict what's happening at borders. And we, as the Balkan Migration Displacement Hub, have regional updates that we publish uh, on our website. So if you just uh, look that up, that's from our end. And I'm sure that IOM also has updates that they publish on the issue. This is not very academic, though. Although I think it, it, it complies with good standards, but it's not 100%. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's what the person is referring to. But Yeah, thank you. And, and Peter, you can confirm that? Yeah, I, I can confirm that. And uh, I would say also, I mean, a little bit of uh, advertisement, I would say if you did, we have something called the Displacement Tracking uh, Matrix website where you can see the figures where you get a sense of what is happening in the Mediterranean, but also globally in terms of migration movements. And then, of course, on our websites, we have the regular reports also that are shorter, but that gives you an update of what is happening in the Western Balkans. And in a very personal uh, pitch, of course, you can always follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> and Ugo, I was wondering if you had any recommendations in terms of uh, background reading material for any listeners interested to get a bit more information on this theme. I would say that uh, uh, certainly MPI publications uh, are at the top and high quality issues uh, are uh, delivered by all the uh, specialized agencies starting from uh, IOM that are very simple to access. But uh, as a, a nuance and very particularity, uh, I would like to suggest to search the CI uh, website with the word migration, because actually the anthology of outcomes of the over 30 events that we arranged to co-finance in these last years, bringing together people working on these issues, uh, shape uh, something interesting, maybe also for further research and developments. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you for the nice uh, compliment. Yes, um, also later today, if you want to access the audio, you can also find there uh, Ugo's uh, PowerPoint presentation, which also includes links uh, to their project and their broader uh, initiatives. So if you have a look there, you can also um, get more information. So the audio from today's webinar will be available at migrationpolicy.org slash events. 
Um, if you would like uh, further information, reporters can contact Michel Mittelstadt at plus 44-2081-23-62-65 or mmittelstadt at migrationpolicy.org. And for any additional information to receive updates, do visit our website at migrationpolicy.org slash sign up. Um, I would like to um, thank our audience for, for listening in and for sending over um, questions. Um, and I would particularly like to uh, thank our um, speakers today. Thank you very much for sharing some of your insights. I know it's a short period um, of uh, just one hour to share some of those insights, but I think we've already covered uh, a number of important elements. And um, thank you all, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.